Thank you so much, Jude, and thank you all. Um, very, uh, very. I feel a lot of honor to speak at the inaugural QSIDE um, Data uh, Data for Justice workshop. Um, and so I'll tell you today about a research project on understanding federal sent sentence disparities. Um, and as you can see here, I have QSIDE on the slide, and that's for two reasons. Um, obviously, we're at a workshop organized by QSIDE that we're very excited about. But the second reason is that it's through this institute that this collaboration came together and that any of the research I will tell you about in this brief talk today uh, came to be. And so first of all, um, we, this is a wonderful team of collaborators that I got to work with. Um, you can see here, um, I got to work with people in applied math, math, computer science, but a bit more unusual to me, criminology and sociology. Um, and I've had so much to learn from them. And so with these people, the question that we were trying to answer had to do with um, focusing and understanding um, sentencing disparities for criminal cases in US district courts. Um, so these are the principal courts in the federal system in the United States. There's 94 of them. Uh, they have about 700 judges or so who have lifetime tenure. Uh, and they're also organized in these re regional circuits that you can see on this. And so when it comes to understanding um, what, what kind of information we have about federal sentences in the district courts, um, it turns out that in, in theory, we have uh, the constitutional right to observe criminal proceedings. And that's really by law. The Supreme Court basically ruled that we have access to this information based on this case um, in 1980. But in practice, can we really exercise that right? Um, and it turns out that in theory, yeah, we can go uh, attend a court proceeding. We can writing down defendants, crime evidence, judges. Um, but really, we probably cannot do tens of thousands of those because we probably have our own jobs or school to do. And so in practice, we actually have no access to high quality, large scale information about the federal criminal justice system. And in absence of, of such data, we also have no clear way to assess sentencing equity. And so the next slide, I will also tell you a little bit about how are these sentences at the federal level, how are decisions in these cases actually made? Um, so we're, the, the history of that is interesting. Before 1987, judges basically had virtually unlimited discretion in the criminal sentences that they imposed means that if you had two people with very similar, similar criminal histories and convicted of the same crime, they might get very different sentences. And that's what happened at that time. In 1987, a commission was formed, the USSC Commission, um, that adopted some guidelines with some ranges of sentences um, based on certain parameters. Um, and the reason for that was to try to mitigate sentencing disparities that they observed were happening before. However, in 2005, uh, based on this case, United States versus Booker, um, the Supreme Court actually ruled those guidelines as advisory, which means that um, as these cases happen, the judges are still required to calculate that range, that guideline of what the sentence should be, but they can impose a different sentence that goes outside of that range. And so we're again in a situation where it's gonna be hard for us to understand um, sentencing disparities and equity given this situation. And in fact, in, in recent years, and in fact, years after 2005, studies have found that more than 50% of cases have sentences that fall outside of that guideline. And so when it comes to understanding sentencing disparity, this is a very active area of research and legal scholarship, and it can sort of take two flavors. One has to do with understanding how defendant characteristics might be related to the severity of sentences. Another might try to relate judge characteristics with severity. It's hard to put all of those together, but there was a study that inspired our work that did just that. Um, and so the study in 2019 put together this large data set of five, more than 500,000 federal cases going from 1999 to 2015, and it had all the information we want. Um, details about defendants, details about the crimes, and um, details about the judge that was sentencing the case. And they had various insights in the study. One of them I have on here that, for instance, Republican appointed judges sentenced Black defendants to three more months than similar non-Blacks. 
Now, the issue with the study, however, is that the source of their data came from this research institute called TRAC, a University of Syracuse, um, that is essentially a proprietary source, which means that it has a use agreement that didn't allow the authors of the study to say anything about individual judges and how they sentence federal cases or to publish this data for others to analyze. And so really this to us was a data transparency issue um, and it became a large data science project. The output of that project was this Just Fair database um, that stands for Judicial System Transparency to Federal Archive and Third Records. And here we put together almost 600,000 federal cases that went from 2001 to 2018 that did have all that information, connecting all these federal cases across defendant, crime, and judge characteristics. Now we've extended it through 2019. Um, and it turns out that in order to do that, we actually had to do cleaning, merging, and various other data science tasks, um, pulling on five different databases. Each of them is publicly available, but together this database that we put together is not. So you can see we had to pull from the US Sentencing Committee, Federal Judicial Center, another one that's called PACER, even Wikipedia, as well as the biographical directory of the federal judge. All of them were necessary to put this database together. And so because, um, so this actually was, I, I wanna say this because you all are gonna work with data and that's messy this weekend. But I wanna say this was just as messy. Consolidation of this database um, took a lot of different steps, which you can see here in this diagram on the right. You can see the different databases that we used coming together. You can also see how we had started with something like more than a million sentences from both of these databases. And we ended up with that almost 600 thousand, so um, less than half of what we could have. And that's because we were conservative at various steps um, and because of various issues like prison sentences that are integers in one database and real value in another, or the fact that judges might have the same initials and might be in the same district. And then we cannot identify judges for certain cases, no matter what we do. And because this was a lot of work, I think we have the right to have this list of shame kind of slide in this presentation, which basically means all, all of these districts on the left column, we were not able to put together any data from them, right, over the span of 18 to 19 years. On the right, we have limited data, less than 30 to 40 percent of the data that we could have in each district. And that's really a testament of how they record their data in a way that we we can't really process, we can't really put it together in any usable, usable form. So kind of like what Bilal said, right? Now we have data, what are the questions? And the questions have to do with sentencing disparity, but it turns out that to kick out any sort of analysis and sentencing disparity um, among federal judges, one must first try to understand whether judges really get assigned truly random selections of the cases in that uh, district. And that's the theory of random assignment. In theory, that should be the case. Like based on the websites of these districts, uh, the cases should be assigned randomly across judges. And that means that if there's data that we don't have in these databases, they really should also be distributed uniformly across judges. And so one might want to look at a certain district and try to understand whether judges have similar distribution of different race, uh, race um, uh, categories in their defendants, different ages, different genders, and different types of crimes. And so the question we tried to answer first before getting to any other analysis was if we saw any systematic between judge differences in case characteristics within each of these districts we had data in. Um, and so we use various approaches to do that. We use some statistical modeling like regression models. We also created these um, sample data sets that are randomly distributed among all of these characteristics. Um, and we use Monte Carlo simulations for that, then compared those data sets with the actual data. So we use multiple approaches to try to answer this question. And unfortunately, it looks like, yeah, probably, there are between judge differences within a district despite what we read on these websites. That makes analysis a lot harder, but we can still look at certain aggregate characteristics. So our next step was to do um, a hierarchical statistical model and to do some aggregate analysis where you can see here one of the insights of our study, but the 
if we condition on case and defendant characteristics, we find that on average, judges assign weight to white defendants sentences that are about 13% shorter than Black defendants and 19% shorter than Hispanic defendants on average. So we really looked at the sentence disparity as how do the judges basically judge these two different populations conditional on other case and defendant characteristics being similar. We also looked at the variation. So if we go a little bit outside the average, a couple of standard deviation, what we found is really large spread in these sentence disparities as well. And so I have one last slide here to talk about limitations because I think that's important and that's something one has to keep in mind in these kind of projects like the one you're undertaking this weekend. Um, for us, they had to do with um, the fact that it's difficult to assess whether these unobserved factors that are not in the data are also influencing these differences. It's hard to measure, to decide exactly what measure of sentence length to use in the models. And it's also difficult to understand things that happened before we saw these data sets. So things like how prosecutors might be more or less gen generous to different defendants. And finally, we did not have a complete data set. We had a less than 50% kind of data set. So that's an important thing to remember as well. But maybe importantly for you all, there are many more sentences um, that happen at the state criminal sentence level. There are many more um, patterns of enforcing justice at the local level um, in data sets that have not been analyzed. And I believe that's what you're doing this weekend. So, And I'm very pumped to see what you come up with. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, 